Hello out there in the internet. Welcome to yet another socially distant episode of the Creative Differences Podcast, where we wear masks and wash our hands. I'm Dallas, and I really miss doing these in the kitchen of my old apartment. Hi, I'm Gabby, and I too miss those days. <laughs> and I'm Demi, here with you guys with a new microphone, because my last one just died on me. So sorry this episode took so long. Improvements. Yes, improvements. Welcome to another episode of Quarantine Watch, where we will be telling you guys about the TV shows today that we've been watching during quarantine. Yes. yes. Um, also, audience, can you tell if Colin is here or not? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> we'll tell you if you're right. Take a guess. You got a 50-50 shot. Is Colin here? Is he just lurking? Is he being quiet? Is he not here at all? Oh, my God. We'll find out together anyway before we get into this watch list recap as we like to call it please like and subscribe to our stuff because it helps us in theory all right guys let's get this started round one we do five shows um per episode so round one starting now dallas you start us off usually you give us a little description so that we can try and guess what you've been watching yes short one this is the show that made me think maybe this character isn't so boring after all Ooh. Any guesses? I, I want to um, say Young Justice. Something about Sal. Um, what is Sal. From, Who's from, Sal? From... Oh, she's talking about Breaking Bad. That Breaking that, Bad spinoff. That one. Oh, Better Call Saul. No, it's not that. Yes. It is Superman, the animated series. I knew it had something to do with DC. Yes. Yes, it does. Which is on the DC universe if you want to watch it. Yeah. I've always grown up thinking Superman was pretty boring because sometimes he is. But... His show is pretty dope. It's not like, it's not as fire as Batman's animated series, but it's still, it's still pretty dope. It was developed by Alan Burnett. I've mentioned him on the podcast before because according to Wikipedia, he's had a hand in virtually every DC animated project since like before I was a thing. <laughs> he's one of the creators of Batman Beyond. Yeah, he's, he's great apparently because he's been pumping out these DC cartoons for decades. It was also developed by Bruce Timm, who is behind most of the DC Animated Universe. And he has some weird shipping ideas, but we're not going to get into that right now because it's not relevant to the show I'm talking about. We've already discussed it on a podcast, a recent podcast, as a matter of fact. Y'all can go check that one out. Yes, or don't, because we don't like to talk about that. Anyway, Ooh. the show stars Tim Daly as Superman, uh, Dana Delaney as Lois Lane, David Kaufman, a.k.a. Danny Phantom, as uh, Jimmy Olsen. And Clancy Brown, a.k.a. Mr. Krabs, as Lex Luthor. Great it's cast. Good, of good choice. Yeah, it's really good. He was an amazing Lex Luthor. And it makes me even more confused about how we ended up with <laughs> the Batman vs. Superman version of Lex Luthor. Because, <laughs> oh, like, goodness. Like, all respect to Jesse Eisenberg as an actor, but what happened there? That wasn't it. I just, that, that was not it. That it was, was not it. I don't understand who okayed that? It's just so many questions. But yeah, I rewatched this because Kayla and I were going through the DC stuff. And it's a really solid show. Good Saturday morning cartoon. You're watching superheroes be superheroes. But it's not super cheesy. Like, they're aware of how cheesy Superman is and has been. But they rein it in a bit here. But not in like a Zack Snyder doom and gloom kind of way like he's still superman he's still fun he's still about truth and justice and all that stuff and hope yeah hope blue and red bright colors also when you keep watching the episodes over and over again it points out a glaring issue with superman as a character is that you have to nerf him in really silly ways to make his villains a challenge because <laughs> he's superman like no one is as strong or fast as he is so you're just it's gonna true. have to think of a silly like you know Obviously, Kryptonite pops up in every other episode because if it didn't, the episode would be one minute long. He'd just punch a guy and that's it. It's like Homelander, but... No, it's Superman's not. Superman's not a bad person, right? <laughs> no, it's not. I think, yeah, Homelander is like... He's reined in by the fact that if he really unleashed, then... He's reined in by the fact that... Yeah, he's reined in by the fact that he doesn't want people to realize he's a horrible human being. He has an image to protect. Yeah. Superman is actually a good person, but he's like, yeah. I don't want to punch this person as hard as I can because they would instantly die. But then yeah. also sometimes he just forgets <laughs> like he has certain powers. 
Like every time he fights this woman with fire powers named Volcana, he just forgets he has ice breath. And I'm like, bro, you have ice breath. Use it. It makes things cold, but whatever. I always believe that characters that have that that amount of power and ability, it's not about nerfing their abilities. It's about giving them like certain character things that are going to be their flaws instead that are going to stand in their way. What do you mean exactly? Like in the back when I was reading Ms. Marvel comics back when um when Carol was Ms. Marvel. Oh right. Ms. Marvel she's, you know, as my brother describes Captain Marvel, she's Superman but with energy powers. Fair. She is super powerful like it's really hard to take down captain marvel because of how like overpowered she is but it's not her superpowers that you go after it's like her character flaws it's the fact that carol wants to be the best superhero ever and sometimes that causes her to make mistakes okay yeah that makes i get what you're saying that's an interesting approach i think colin had kind of a complaint about that with Captain Marvel when she becomes Captain Marvel because he was like she's so strong but then every issue he reads it's something that about her getting in her own way that stops her but I don't mind I mean that's the only way you're gonna stop that person yeah like that's better than he just doesn't use some of the powers that he has but that's the thing with Superman is that (laughs) they didn't really want to give him a lot of character flaws (laughs) because he's supposed to be like the boy scout and just 100% good but I mean, even then, there's a flaw in being like the Boy Scout, because then if you're always seeing the good in people, then you're going to miss the flaws and, you know, the things that make them bad. Yeah, That doesn't necessarily mean Superman has to kill them, but like it means that he might miss something. Yeah, which I think is another great part about the DC animated universe is that over time, all these shows are connected. So like the characters grow by the time Justice League comes around. Anytime Superman hears the name Darkseid or Brainiac, he's like, it's on sight. I don't care <laughs> what they're here for. I'm going to s- just start throwing hands, which I love. Also, last thing I'll say is the crossover episodes with Batman and by extension Joker and Harley are like my favorite things. There's an episode where, oh, wait, I'm trying to remember if this is a Superman episode or a Batman episode, but I think it's Superman. Batman goes missing from Gotham. And Clark goes to Gotham and pretends to be Batman. <laughs> oh my With gosh. Robin's help. Like Tim Drake is teaching him how to act like Batman. Like he wears the Batman suit and he just shows up and he fights. I think it's Bane or somebody. And he just like punches him across the room and Bane's That's like, what the amazing. hell is going on? <laughs> it's the best thing in the world. Like one of my favorite moments is they're about to leave the, you know, little rooftop with the bat signal on it and clark reaches for his left side to grab his grappling hook and you just hear robin go other side (laughs) he reaches to the other side yes i love it kind of kind of reminds me of the episode of smallville where i think clark disguised himself as green arrow because lois thought that oliver was green arrow oh yeah smart she was accusing him and so instead clark to help him keep his his secret identity dresses up as green arrow Yeah, great stuff. So yeah, I would recommend this show for people who like Superman because obviously that's a thing that you would like. Moving on. See, That would be Gabby. Yes, Gabby. Moving on to you. It's my turn. Okay. Um, So I watched a few months ago a show called Solar Opposites on Hulu. It's an animated show? It is an animated show. Yes. And it is created by Justin Roiland and Mike McMahon. Justin Roiland is one of the creators of Rick and Morty. Right. So the show is done in like the Rick and Morty animation style. And you can recognize Justin Roiland. He's the voice of Rick. He's also voicing one of the main characters on the show. The other voice actors are Thomas Middleditch, uh, Mary Mack, and Sean... Uh, so sorry i forgot to check how to pronounce his name but i think it's giambrone or giambrone and it's about uh four aliens that move to earth with a pupa and the pupa is basically going to take over the world and turn into their alien planet but for now they're just hanging out on earth waiting for the pupa to turn interesting i keep seeing trailers for that i mean not so much now but i saw it a lot before it came out 
Yeah, it's delightful. There's only eight episodes, and uh, like I'm obsessed with it. My fr- my partner is obsessed with it, and oh, we just like we'll sit around and quote it to each other. It's very <laughs> funny, um, very silly, and and but it's not quite as mean as or not mean, but it's not quite as like intense emotionally as uh, Rick and Morty. It's a lot more on the silly side. Well, that's good. Yeah, because it's about aliens like figuring out Earth and Earth culture. It's it's not about like a drunk that's descending into like I don't know terrorizing his family. Yeah, uh, terrorizing his family and the universe. Yeah, no. Um, this one's just some aliens, and one of them is really cute. Her name is Jess. Oh, she's just adorable. She's the sweetest little thing. Sorry, Jessie. Her name is Jessie, and she's adorable. So that's Solar Opposites. I highly recommend it. Um, there's like this running gag throughout the show. Um, so anytime somebody pisses off Jesse or um, her. So it's like two adults and two small children and two children. So anytime somebody makes Jesse or Yumulak mad, they shrink the person and they put them in this. Basically, it's like a hamster enclosure, but it takes up an entire wall. And Goodness. so throughout the show, yeah, it's, that that part is messed up, but it's hilarious. <laughs> so they like put the person in the wall. So there's just these clips of like people trying to make a society <laughs> in this in the wall. wall. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> Yeah, it's very dark, but also compelling. Question. I mean, I imagine it would be, yeah. So that's like my favorite running gag. And uh, Jesse feeds them candy. So it's people just living off of candy in this wall. Sounds like my dream. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really funny. It's really good. I do really recommend Solar Opposites. and It's on Hulu. Dope, dope. So my list, we're going all the way back to May. Because this is Let's how long back. it's taking us to get through these shows. <laughs> um, and I watch shows d- d- far too quickly. Um, yeah, we're going all the way back to May. And um, I was being a super film nerd and I checked out the show Prop Culture on Disney+. Plus. Prop Culture is hosted by Daniel Lanigan. And uh, basically the synopsis that's on IMDb is discover the beloved artifacts behind some of your favorite Disney films and prop culture and original series. Oh, my and- God. That's uh, not a lie. I freaking loved this show because <laughs> it was straight up just like, we're going to go find and search for props of from all your favorite freaking Disney movies and, um, oh, and even some that I've never watched. Um, well, I have now. Um, first episode, I almost cried because it was Mary Poppins. And I've been watching Mary Poppins since I was a small child. Julie Andrews is one of my favorite actresses because of that movie and Sound of Music. So, like, to see all the props and to hear all the emotional stuff behind it, just like, ugh, fantastic. It's really cool because I feel like it's it's almost like Disney anthropology. Like, yeah. Daniel literally just, you know, they pick a movie and he goes searching for props. And some movies, it's a little bit harder than others to go find those props. And other movies, they're more recent. So, you know, it's a little bit easier. Um, movies like Mary Poppins, it's really hard. Uh, I think Tron also was very hard for them to find some of the props. Um, they did. So the, the episodes that they do, there's Mary Poppins, Tron, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, oh Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and The Muppet Movie. Wow. Okay. One thing. Yeah. Where do they go searching for these props? Is it just on Disney property? No, they go all over the world. Oh, my God. They go all over the world. They go to. um, So in the Pirates of the Caribbean episode, he legitimately goes to where they shot like the Caribbean set pieces. Um, So he goes to their sets because they have like um, because they still have some of their set pieces still up as if, you know, they weren't prop pieces. Um, I think he goes to where one of the ships is being kept in Northern California. Um, I think they flew him to England for Mary Poppins uh, for that episode. It's just really great. It's 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 uh, it's not even just like a look into like props, which until recently weren't considered, you know, very valuable or expensive, which is why they didn't keep all this prop stuff until recently. Yeah. But like you also get knowledge into how they made the movie because, you know, some they, for like Tron, for instance, 
there's a lot of concept art that they looked at because Tron is, I don't think any movie has ever been made the same way that Tron was. Tron was ahead of its time. Um, and he talks to like the filmmakers about their experiences making the film and uh, like the legacy of the film of the films and stuff like that. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia episode, he showed the kids from the movie, like their wardrobe from when they were in the movie. And because obviously they're all grown now and oh, like wow. the prop weapons that they used from the movie and stuff. So it's really cool just watching all of these people who worked on these films years and years ago. And to see them interact with these props, but also just to see the props that you grew up with. And you're like, yeah, I remember that thing. And I remember that thing. And you get like really cool insider stories just about, you know, Disney in general. For instance, Walt Disney's office has um, a piano in it. First off, Walt Disney's office is still dressed and made up the same way that Walt Disney had it when he was still alive. Yeah, he they, wow. they basically treat it as a sealed vault. And yeah. when you work for Disney Imagineering, they will like do raffles or games and things. And the prize could be to go into Walt's office and see it. Yeah, so on the show for the Mary Poppins episode, they actually go to his office to check out the piano. And they brought one of the songwriters from Mary Poppins to, oh. to come in with them and he sat at the piano and he said he was the only person who was allowed to play that piano and whenever he would sit at that piano Walt would ask him to play um, Feed the Birds from Mary Poppins because it was oh. his favorite song it's like little tidbits like that that really like makes this show really worth watching it's it's if you're into that type of stuff if you're really into filmmaking apparently Disney has a secret warehouse where they keep all of their props that makes sense this is not a surprise <laughs> Listen, if I don't make it as a filmmaker, I will gladly be a Disney archivist because it's so awesome. Low key, I want to go into library sciences so I can do something like that because Disney's not the only like place that does this. There's also like every other major studio has like a department for archiving like that. Yeah, and for Tron, they like the the Flynn sign for the for the ar- for the arcade. They had it. Um, they renovated the sign. They had it restored. So it's just it's so cool. Just it's a really awesome show and I would highly recommend it. It's just it's fun, it's informational. Um my younger uh brother, my my like 12-year-old brother, he watched a couple of episodes with me cuz he's really into like animation and stuff like that. So it's a good time all around. Yeah. I I love the idea of that. My mom loves Mary Poppins. It's like one of the first like it's one of the only Disney movies that I know she like really genuinely loves. So. Yeah. So I would recommend watching it. Highly recommend it. Um, I hope they get I hope that they do a season two because I'm highly fascinated as to what other movies they would choose to do and to see what props they find. Because it's really cool when he just goes off to like find these props, um, especially like who framed Roger Rabbit. Like that's interesting, oh, yeah. too, because they went to go find the car that they used for for the buggy in the movie. So, oh, wow. It's, it's all sorts of just really cool stuff that most people probably wouldn't think about. But I'm a super film nerd. So I was like, I got to check out this show. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to suggest something to you. There is a TikTok of this prop master. Um, And he, like, shows you a bunch of, like, unique props that, um, like, in a really quick TikTok segment that, like, you wouldn't think about unless you were the sound guy who has to, like, edit it, right? He's like, I don't want noisy bags. So they, like, have specially made foam Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, prop culture on Disney Plus. Check it out. It's dope. Round two. Dallas, what you got? Round two, and for those playing at home, no Colin is not here. So if that was your guess, you are correct. Congratulations. Yes. I can't. <laughs> you win nothing. All right, round two. Da-da-da-da-da-da. This show is 99% of the reason I wanted Gabby's Apple TV password. I don't even Yay! remember what's on Apple TV, <laughs> if I'm honest. I think I know. I think I know what it is, and I'm so excited. What, okay, what is it? One. Guess. Yeah, what is it? Uh, Mystery... Qu- er. Oh God, Mystic Mystery Quest, Quest? Mystic, Mystic Quest. Quest, Raven's Banquet. Yes, Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet. Uh, Gabby talked yes. about it before, but I hadn't watched it back then, so I didn't really say much. Now I have, and I freaking love it. <clears throat> oh so my God! This show yes, was yes. created by Charlie Day, Rob McElhenney, and Megan Gans. Megan was a writer for Community, Always Sunny, and Modern Family. Rob McElhenney is the star of the show, and you know who Charlie Day is. Stars Rob McElhenney, Charlotte Nickdow, David Hornsby, Danny Pudi, Imani Hakim, and a bunch of other people. 
For those who don't know what I'm talking about, the IMDb summary is the owner of a successful video game design company and his troubled staff struggle to keep their hit game Mythic Quest on top. So first off, <laughs> this is one of the funniest shows I've seen all year. And it's like just so ridiculous. And that's exactly what I expected because as soon as I see Rob, I think ridiculous humor that I would be surprised he got away with in some cases. It's so that, good. It's just so good. It's so good. But that being said, two of the best episodes were so good to me because of like the emotion that they brought, even more than how funny they were. Oh, yeah. Which is the Dark Quiet Death episode, which I know that's a lot for a title. I love but that, that one episode stars, so much. Um, yeah, Jake Johnson and Kristen Milioti. Mm-hmm. Milioti, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it's just, it's so good. It's and so good. It was not like, you tell me, oh, Jake Johnson is guest starring on this show. I'm like, cool, they're going to be as ridiculous as possible. And they weren't. Like, they were, but they weren't. That show had, that episode had so much, like, heart, and it yeah. hits you right in the feelings. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. And yeah, I didn't want to say anything other than I was like, my favorite episode has nothing to do with the show. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's all I was thing. willing to say. <laughs> yeah, is that like it really doesn't have anything to do with the story, but it's so good that you don't even mind. And then also the quarantine episode at the end, like that ending with, never mind, I'm not going to give away oh, ending. Yeah. We don't do that here. But yeah, shout out to Katie McElhaney, who's Rob's sister. She wrote the Dark Quiet Death episode and Rob directed it. She's my hero, and he did a great job. They're both great. I've noticed that, like, really funny shows, when you notice that the main star is not in the episode, a lot of times they'll be the one directing it. Like, Donald Glover, I think, directed the Atlanta the episode with... Ban? Yeah. I want to say he directed that one. That makes sense. Yeah. That would make sense. Rob McElhaney, he has a knack for creating a cast of completely ridiculous characters. Yeah. And then my favorite thing is that they'll insert normal people as the straight man oh yeah in this show john dimaggio who was one of my favorite voice actors he plays a bender on futurama and jake on adventure time he plays the straight man in this show in a very perfect way because he works at a different video game company and they operate like normal people so when he talks to poppy about her company like just the frustration and manic energy that she has he's just like what's what's going on are you okay like when they talk about that kid who reviews the games, Pootie Shoe. Oh, yeah. And they're like that little asshole. And then yeah. the other company's like, he's a child. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> what? He's like, oh, yeah, that's what we call him at my company. He was like, huh. And she was like, yeah, it kind of feels weird now to say it out loud. And he was like, yeah, probably because he's a child. <laughs> 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 but he's great. And I don't get to see John DiMaggio in a lot of live action. So I appreciated that. Yeah, I didn't realize that he was a voice actor. I thought he was just like an actor man. And yeah, he's wow. like one of the most prolific voice actors to the point where when I see him in person, I don't recognize him. Like I recognize wow. his voice instantly, but I was like, is that DiMaggio? Yeah, I'm like looking and holy moly, he's in so much. Yeah, he's all over the place. He's everywhere. He's one of the dopest voice actors in the game. Shout out to you, John, if you're listening. I very much doubt it. But um... <laughs> He could be one of the 12. He could be one of the 12. If you're 20. one of the 12, please let us know because it would make my freaking day. Also, one of my favorite characters in the show is Sue, the lady who works in the basement. Oh my God, I love Sue. She has this like... <laughs> that was super... really loud. I'm so sorry. No, it's good. That's the energy we need. She has like a super sunny disposition despite I would play with all Sue. these idiots. I would oh, play yeah. Sue. I would love to see you play Sue. Like the oh, way God. that she... I would have so much fun when she would have was about to bring up a Bible and they were like, no, Sue. And she was like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> or like how she's just so sunny. They just keep her in the basement. And then you realize that they're going to probably send more other people to the basement. <laughs> so I think my, one of my favorite moments from her is when those little girls are getting a tour of the office. Yes. And one of them is going to Sue. Like, oh, what do you do? And she tells them what she does. And she's like, <laughs> so you know how when you're really mad at your mom and you just like scream at her or like, you just want to like scream into the pillow. She's like, I'm like the pillow (laughs) and like your mom. (laughs) And one of the girls is like, you seem so nice. I want to do what you do. And she's like, no, like, no, (laughs) no, 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 no. no." It's so, uh, it's so funny. Seth. 
And oh god, also, it's like me at work where they're like, "Wow, oh, you're just so positive," and I'm like, "Yeah," but it's like sometimes it's soul crushing. <laughs> and then when they had the, uh, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like, it's like I wouldn't expect this to be something that makes me laugh. But when they had their Nazi situation. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh God! And they like leaned all the way into it. Yes, and he's like, "Oh, we know what we'll do. We'll flush them out. Like we'll bait them with like a Nazi salute that you can purchase." Nazi, yeah. Like, <laughs> to me, basically, what they do is they try to bait the Nazis by including Nazi things in the game, so the Nazis will like come out of hiding and they can get rid of all of them. But Sue, although that like, wasn't really the original plan, they were just like, for some reason, they were just like. He just kept saying Nazi like, shit. Flesh and then you were like, like, like oh, God. I don't know. I don't think he had a full plan. <laughs> no, he didn't. But poor Sue was just like, no, 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 like, no, 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 no. Oh, also, Ian is his name, even though it's yeah, spelled it's spelled I A N, but it's pronounced Ian. Yeah. So she's like, so Ian, it it seems like what you're doing is putting more Nazi Nazi things in the game, when what what we wanted was zero Nazi things in the game. <laughs> She's just trying to understand, like, what are you doing, Ian? I thought we were getting rid of the Nazi stuff, not adding more to it. But also, she's, like, the point person for, like, anything that raises a flag, like, yeah. socially for the game. So she's also, like, being called by, like, companies that are investing and sponsoring the game. Yeah. She's so the she's pillow like, that anybody yells into. Oh, God. <laughs> so Poor funny. Sue. This but yes, lady. this show is great, and I would recommend it if you are a fan of Always Sunny and that type of humor. This yep. is right up your alley. And oh, it's on it's Apple so TV good. if you want to watch it. Find a friend yeah. who has the password. Or pay for Apple TV. It's like less than $5 a month. You could do that, too, if you want to go that way. About it. That's fine. Moving on. <laughs> oh, is it my turn? It is your turn. Colin is not here, remember? Yay! Okay. So, I watched a show, another one on Hulu, and it is called Woke. It stars uh, Lamorne Morris. Oh, my uh, God. Rose McIver, Blake Anderson, Sashir Sh- Zameda. And it features the voices of Nicole Byer, uh, Cree Summer, a bunch of other really great and prolific uh, black comedians. Yes. Um, and it was created by Keith Knight, who is a famous uh, cartoonist. It kind of starts with... Um, the incident that made Keith Knight, it's a little bit semi-autobiographical, but also like whimsical, question mark? <laughs> yes. Um, I would say whimsical, actually, yeah. Because like the main character's name is Keith Keith Knight. So I'm assuming it's like semi-autobiographical. Yeah, definitely. About Keith Knight, because it's also about a cartoonist. Mm-hmm. And um, Keith Knight's, I know Keith Knight's like first experience with like, or like negative experience with police really changed a lot of the way that he did cartooning. So that's basically what the show is about. It's about this cartoonist, Keith played by Lamorne Morris, who is a whose cartoon is very famous with white people. He's like, you know, he's like, whatever, we should all just, you know, whatever, try to get along. I'm unproblematic, blah, blah, blah. His cartoons about to enter syndication is very famous with it has a mostly white audience. Yes. And he's about to just kind of make it as a cartoonist for basically the rest of his life. And then while he's putting up posters for an event that he's going to put on, um, he gets tackled by police and held at gunpoint. And then they realize that he's quote unquote, not the suspect and they just leave. And it really messes with his head. Right. Because before he was very like, whatever, let's all get along. Yeah. That's not going to happen to me. Yeah, exactly. That was more of what it was. And then this time he's like, Oh shit, it would happen to me. Um, and then his roommate goes, oh, shit, you're woke now. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> and then his roommate is just like, do not start preaching about anything because you're going to ruin your career. And that's immediately exactly what he does. And so the season's about him coming to terms with, you know, he can't turn a blind eye to it anymore. Um, and that he wants to be more socially involved. But he's also like, I also have to make a living. And so it's it's a really interesting show. Um, it takes place in San Francisco. That it and does. It's like delightful and uh, socially conscious, and I, I like the perspective that it took because I feel like we like every person of color kind of 
unless you're you you experience things very very young we all kind of have that moment where we're like oh shit i am being mistreated right <laughs> i am one of those people and yeah. um it's interesting to watch that unfold i don't think i've seen something like that on screen before i love it so much it's actually <laughs> this is on my list i was going to talk about it probably in a future episode because please my list do. is in chronological order but i mean if oh it's on God, his list so i feel like you should just talk yeah, about it yeah i'm just going to I'm just going to piggyback on your thing and then. Yay. <laughs> Actually wrote down all the voice cameos as I like was trying to figure out who they were. Oh, yay. Go ahead. And so, me. yes, we have Eddie Griffin and Nicole Byer as 40 ounces. We have Sam Richardson and Tony Hale as Toast and Butter, the characters that he draws. Tony Hale is a buster from Arrested Development. J.B. Smoove is the marker. He has the most recognizable voice of all the cameos. Which makes sense because the cause the marker is like around a lot, right? Yeah, so JB be popping up. Cedric the Entertainer is a trash can outside a barbershop. Oh. Lil Rel Howery is a t-shirt. Cree Summer is a paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith David is a Bible because of course he is. <laughs> because he has the voice to be the word of God. So I, man, like there's not a lot of shows that I watched this year that I like, thought were funnier than mythic quest but woke is definitely <laughs> up there woke is oh like, yeah it definitely is it's one of my favorite shows i've seen in a very long time it's so good lamorne is amazing uh the roommates blake anderson and t murph are both hilarious yes. and i love the way that the three of them play off each other dude especially blake anderson where he's just <laughs> like oh god it's just <laughs> Uh, Gunther, he's great. Perfect, he's great. When they do the cornrows, I was just like, no one's gonna, no one's gonna comment on the, <laughs> on the cornrows. <laughs> uh, that was when he like was with that couple, right? Yep. That whole dynamic was super interesting. It's so weird and so great. But I, I do like it. that this show like leans into its weirdness. It's like we know this is just gonna be a, a strange concept, or like yeah. a like a strange like way to show these feelings so we're just gonna really lean into it yeah because it's like being woke makes you hear voices <laughs> saying things that like like when he walks out of the barbershop that's called darnell's and it's just white boys inside oh yep and they're like oh the old black dude he moved back down south but we kept the name and the soul of the place so they have like ebony magazines <laughs> and they give hennessy with their bar with their haircuts oh god so he goes outside and then Cedric the Entertainer, the talking trash can, talks about how they're man bun wearing gentrifying devils. Which, I mean, aren't they? I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> He's like, Darnell's not from the South. He's from Cleveland. Kill a hipster, save your hood. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Uh, Which it's fits so because good. it's in San Francisco. That's true. <laughs> Bay Area, getting woke. But man, I love this show so much. Like, down to like the scene where he's actually harassed and then as soon as gunther shows up the cops like immediately host their guns which is exactly like, what happened to um keith knight like yeah. his white his white housemate like ran off a bus and like got up in the cops faces yeah he's like and screaming that's the at only him and everything mm-hmm. and that's the only reason he was like allowed to go free and then what was funny was gunther was like wow i can't believe they did that to us yeah, it's like they us. Did us like that <laughs> Uh, yeah and it's funny because like you see that and it's very easy to like read gunther as just the oblivious white boy but he's not like he's a lot there's a lot more to his character that we find out later yeah like he gets more upset with a lot of the racism stuff than anyone else in the show but he's like it's not like he's like i can't get mad at what you're doing because you're black it's not really my place to, like uh, yeah it's so good but Everyone in the show is amazing. Yeah. And I love it so I, much. I like Gunther's character because it, it it covers the awkwardness of like wanting to back your black friends, but also not knowing exactly what you can do or say. Yeah. Which I feel like, like what's, is what's my lane here? Yeah, exactly. It's like what's my lane? And then also overstepping and like trying to figure out your lane. I I do like that because I feel like I feel like it's relevant, but yeah. it's also like um I haven't seen it before, or I haven't seen it done like quite this well. Yeah, they did it really well. But yeah, it's a great show. I also recommend it. Yay! To me, I recommend it to you specifically, because I don't know if you've watched Have you watched it? 
No, I saw, I sort of saw clips of it, but like, I wasn't, I like, I like Lamorne, but I wasn't particularly like interested per se. I love Lamorne. I do. He's funny. I think you'd like it. Possibly. But you have like 50 shows you're watching at any given time, so. That's true. My yeah. watch you get list through is, them so quickly. <laughs> my watch list is ever growing. It uh, it evolves and it never ends. But yeah, speaking That's... of your watch list, what's next on it's... your list? Yeah. Yes, continuing my film and television geekery. The next show on my list is Disney Gallery: The Mandalorian, which is on Disney Plus. Uh, it's a documentary which features John Favreau, Dave Filoni, Kathleen Kennedy, Deborah Chow, Rick Famuyiwa, Bryce Dallas Howard, Taika Waititi, Pedro Pascal. Gina Carano, Carl Weathers, Ludwig Gorenzen, Richard Bluff, who does Star Wars visual effects, John Knoll, who also does Star Wars visual effects, and Hal Hickel, who worked in animation. The show is a behind-the-scenes look at the making of Disney Plus series The Mandalorian, and The Mandalorian was, like, one of my favorite TV series, if not my favorite TV series of last year. So, of course, I was going to check out the documentary series about how it was made, especially with all of its technological advancements and Boy, was I in for a treat when I watched it. Quite literally, that show is uh, a dream of mine. (laughs) I would love to one day direct something Star Wars and then get to sit around a table with a bunch of other directors and writers and talk about how much I love Star Wars and the storytelling in Star Wars and the important mythicness of Star Wars. And uh, yeah, that's literally all I want to do with my life. And this show is the embodiment of that. Every episode focuses on a different aspect of the show, which was really cool. Um, And I think they're all about a half hour or so. Um, Episode one focuses on directing. Episode two is legacy. Three is cast. Four is technology. Five is practical. Six is visualization. Seven is score. And eight is connections. Just a really, really great show, especially for anybody who is a huge Star Wars fan like I am. There is a part in episode two, I believe, where Dave Filoni basically breaks down the theme of fatherhood, starting from episode one and goes through an entire thread all the way through episode six. And it is Amazing. I was listening to him speak and literally was laying in bed. And the more he spoke, the more I sat up because I had never thought about it before. And it was like mind blowing the knowledge that that man has about Star Wars. But that's what happens when George Lucas is your mentor into the Star Wars universe. Yeah. Also explains Darth Vader a little bit, right? If father's the theme. Yeah, about, yeah, just that that particular theme. It's just, I would highly recommend just looking up that clip of him talking about it. It's probably like five minutes of him talking. And it's just like, it's great because it's, it's who's sitting at that table at that moment. It's him, John Favreau, Bryce Dallas Howard, Taika, Rick, and Deborah. It's all the directors. Wow. And as Dave is talking and just explaining this through line, just you can see all the directors are just like so intrigued and interested and just like oh my gosh this is amazing like you can see it all clicking for all of them and they're all kind of taking notes on like on what george lucas created it's just amazing and it's just ugh, that's it's what i love about star wars this show is just what i love about star wars being discussed at a round table yeah that sounds amazing also like i feel like now they would probably want to direct stuff in season two right because they know that through line I'm sure it would add an extra layer of depth to their storytelling. Well, I mean, all of them, I think by that point, most of them had already signed on whether or not they were going to be doing the next season or not. I don't think Deborah uh-huh. could because she's working on the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. But uh-huh. Rick Rick was offered to direct on Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he, I think he turned it down to continue working on The Mandalorian. It was just recently announced that there are, I think, eight episodes for season two. And John Favreau wrote, I think, six of them. And then I think Dave Filoni wrote one and Rick wrote one. Ooh. I can't wait. I'm so excited for this season. Cannot wait. October 30th. It's going to be hype, bro. It's going to be mad cool. But yeah, it's just, it's a great show that goes into the history of Star Wars, the impact that the, that Star Wars has had, its legacy, why it's so important to people, um, what it did for storytelling, what it did for filmmaking, what it continues to do for technology, like the creation of the volume, for instance. There's an entire episode about Ludwig Gorenson's score, and it's phenomenal. 
because I love Ludwig Göransson. He's probably my favorite contemporary composer. I agree. It's just it's great. The whole series is just a great insight into Star Wars and into this particular series. So if you're into Star Wars or if you're just into like television in general and how it's made, especially because this is kind of a new way of making television, then I would highly recommend uh, checking out Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian. Yeah. I want to work on The Mandalorian just to like be in front of those really awesome LED screens. Like I can't imagine how crazy and cool it is. Uh, but also, like they talk about some of the some of the people who have worked on Star Wars in in past years and stuff like that, and also what technological advancement in film, like you know, has helped improve um, or helped inspired Star Wars, and then also like what inspired some of these like visual effects creators and artists to uh, to get into the field that they're in, because um, some of them have been working on Star Wars since day one, since the original series. So there's like not just a legacy of like star wars in like filmmaking like how we make films but also there is a legacy within lucas films itself where you have people who have been working there since star wars began and who have stories that they pass on to other workers and you know all the thing all the techniques that you use to create a star wars movie that just passes on from star wars movie to star wars movie and how you evolve and how you how you build off of that so um, that's i don't know man this is like I said, it's just everything that I love about Star Wars kind of encapsulated into a show and discussed in a show and probably done far more articulately than than I could ever do. So, yeah, check that out. Yeah, that's definitely going to be one that I check out because that sounds like also the things that I love. Well, also, like, I feel like you and I are probably people that watch that three hour Star Wars documentary that came with the DVDs and we're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Uh, I did. Empire of Dreams. Yes, I freaking love that. Which is also it's, on Disney+. Plus. Oh, oh. I love it so much. <laughs> oh God, it's just it just makes you feel like well, because it started so ragtag, so yeah. it makes you just feel like wow, like you can build anything, even though like you know, yeah. Anyway, it's it's that's exciting. It's it my brand. Like show. Your it is brand. my brand. brand. It is very much my brand. I love it. I don't know, man. I'm wearing Star Wars socks right now. It's great. <laughs> Build-A-Bear has a Baby Yoda, and it looks like the softest, cuddliest thing ever, and I impulse bought it today. I was, like, <laughs> buying it. I went to Target specifically to buy stuff for, like, painting miniatures, since that's my new hobby. And I went accidentally kind of passed by the toy section, and me and my brother saw Baby Yoda and stopped. And I was just like, I'm so distracted by this Baby Yoda right now. It's great. Baby Yoda is awesome. Sounds Dallas, cool. round three, my guy. Yeah. Round three. This show is the main reason I got the DC Universe streaming service. Oh, Young Justice. Of course it's Young Justice. Absolutely. Yes. um, As it should be. (laughs) Developed by Brandon Vietti and Greg Wiseman. Brandon worked on Jackie Chan Adventures and The Batman. He also directed Batman Under the Red Hood, which slaps. And Greg Wiseman is one of the creators of Gargoyles, which is amazing. And one of the developers of The Spectacular Spider-Man, which is also amazing. I don't know the difference between created by and developed by in terms of television. So I'm using them the way Wikipedia does. Don't ask me why I'm switching back and forth. The show stars Jesse McCartney, Kari Payton, Nolan North, Danica McKellar, Stephanie Lemelin, Jason Spizak, and probably every other voice actor working today. You know, you make a point. Ironically, John DiMaggio does not appear to be in it. Not yet. Right. But everyone else is. If you ask me a voice actor, they're probably on that show at some point because it goes so deep. Anyway, the IMDb summary is teenage superheroes strive to prove themselves as members of the Justice League. And that does not nearly do the show justice because it does justice. not. Because, man, that is not what the show is about. <laughs> it started off that way. Yeah. And then it just got more and more intense and the stakes got raised higher and higher. And then there's alien. And it invasion. became for adults. Yes. And like xenophobia. And it's some of my favorite superhero content ever, like TV, live action, animated movies, anything. It's amazing. It's definitely one of my favorite animated shows of of like ever. Same. Like it is up there. Yeah. So there's a pretty jarring five year time jump to start season two. And like, it's like, whoa, what are we doing here? But it is worth it for me because you get to see the characters. I get to see the characters. A little bit more. Yeah. The ones that I love from season one grow up. And then we get more characters because. Now that Dick Grayson can be Nightwing, we get Tim Drake as Robin because it's been five years. And Jason Todd's already dead. So, you know. Ooh. Or is he? Dun, dun, dun. I don't know. 
We'll find out in season four, maybe. Who knows? Hopefully. We better after they <laughs> left us on that cliffhanger in early season three that I was waiting for them to wrap up. Right. And like barely, like it's one of those, you might miss it. And even if you see it, you might not get it. Man. It's so vague, but they got to do something with it. It was such a good cliffhanger too. Cause I was like, Damien, Talia, <laughs> Jason. Is that Jason? But yeah. Um, speaking of characters growing, not enough recognition is given to Superboy's character growth in this show. I love Connor Kent. Connor goes from Rage Monster in season one to like a collected role model <laughs> for the team. By the time we're in season three, he's like a borderline father figure for these people. Yeah, if wow. Superboy isn't my favorite character on the show, he's definitely top three. Yeah, I feel like mine changes with every season because the show changes so much, but he's up there. It really depends. Yeah, but Superboy is definitely one of my favorite characters on the show. Yes. Um, speaking of all the voice actors in the world, this is one of the last times we got to hear, uh, hear Miguel Ferrer and his yes. amazing voice. Because on this show, he plays Vando Savage, and he is also known as Sean Yu from Mulan. He has one of the best voices ever. And I was so glad to hear it again before he passed on. Yeah, this is just some of the best superhero content period it's just so dope in season three like i was watching it when it came out and then never finished it and then recently yeah me and you never finished right so then kayla and i went back and we just like let's watch the whole thing so we watched all of the show and season three you definitely should it's worth it like going back to see everything is like one cohesive story but season three definitely pulled fewer punches (laughs) because it's not a cartoon network show anymore it's a streaming show so Yeah, they didn't care. They were like, yo, we got some grown folk watching this show. Let's get it. Yeah, they're like, this is not a kid's show. So we can say that that name sounds like a stripper name. And we can have McGann tell her fiance that all she's wearing is her engagement ring. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) And one of, okay, I talk about this scene as often as possible because it's the most ridiculous thing I've seen in a show that was once for kids. But the line, you've never had black lightning before. Oh, God. But also, also what? the hotel scene with him and uh, and the doctor. Oh, yeah. He 100% off screen laid the pipe. Oh, yeah. Because when we come back, they're laying in bed together. Mm-hmm. Oh, but this show's for like grownups now, right? So. Yeah. They oh, basically. The, they're like, this ain't for kids anymore. This is for the they people were... who have the streaming service. Yeah. They were like, the kids who were watching this show when it first aired are now grown adults. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But man, like, why in the show that was ever for kids do you have Black Lightning on top of a villain grabbing her saying, you've never had Black Lightning before, and then shocking her so hard she passes out? Ooh, like, no. who is that for? <laughs> Sounds uh, that was the uh, that was like the first episode too. I think that was like one of the first like, hints that it was like, "Yo, this is not for kids anymore." They were not playing games because that was the yeah. same scene where we saw um, Violet die for like the first time, and they don't one play the whenever, scenes. whenever uh, Halo, right? Yeah, Halo, <laughs> Violet, Halo. I think Violet is the name that she chooses. Halo. Anytime that girl dies on screen, it's just it's this what? It's yeah. hardcore. Gabby, Halo is a character who can come back to life after she dies. Okay. I was I was sh- starting to get that. Yeah. But in the show has a lot of fun with that. So like, oh, oh goodness. she can die and come back. And also the show isn't for kids anymore. So let's see how many violent ways we can kill this kill character. Kill this character. Fucked up. And they do not shy away from it. But yes, if you're into DC comics, I one hundred percent recommend this show. Oh my gosh. Please. Or just it, like into superheroes. If you like any superhero shows, you'll probably like this one. Because it's amazing. And it's just like Justice League Unlimited, but with more fleshed out storylines and a different character focus. Also, if you're going to watch it, when you get to the scene where he says, you've never had Black Lightning before, let me know how you reacted to it. Also, I think Young Justice has possibly my favorite Justice League scene ever in it. Or actually, episode, which is like season one, which is when they're deciding who should join the Justice League. I love that episode. That was a great one. It's a good episode. That's a really good one. There's some great lines from like all the characters in that in that scene, especially when they're asking if they should bring in Guy Gardner, and and they all go no. Both the Green Lanterns are like nope. Yeah. Also, it's one of my favorite characterizations of uh, Black Canary. 
I remember watching this show for the first time a few years ago and just being like, oh my gosh, they got her like so right. She was amazing. That's like the team mom. And she's played by Vanessa Marshall, who plays Hera in Star Wars Rebels. So yeah, love her. Yeah, Vanessa Marshall plays a lot of voice, like heroes and stuff. She's good at that. All right, we should probably move on to Gabby. To Gabby. Oh, yeah. Okay. So my next TV show is The Duchess on Netflix. It's created and written by and stars uh, the stand-up comedian Catherine Ryan. And it's like semi-autobiographical kind of as well as the other one. Just like woke a little bit where um, Catherine Ryan talks about like how she's a single mom and they have like a whole mess of animals and all this stuff. But the TV show um, is about a single mother who's doing really well, like career wise, um, has a tumultuous relationship with her um, baby's or her daughter's father. And she's thinking about having another child and it's proving to be difficult because everyone's pretty judgy about a single woman that wants to have a child on her own (laughs) if you like Catherine ryan's like comedy it's really good um i think she can rub people the wrong way very easily but i love her and one of the reasons i love this show is because of her wardrobe it's (sighs) how do i express how amazing her clothes are (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like you can tell that they went that they spent a lot of the budget just on the clothes and how the co- the costume de- designers just had a lot of fun with her because everyone around her dresses normal but she's just like very extra and it's amazing um i'm not quite done with the series yet but it's been like really great so far i got to episode three and it's a little bit ridiculous and silly and um I just like it so much. Um, I don't know what else to say. That means that it's my turn then. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the third show on my list is Insecure on HBO. Insecure stars Issa Rae, Yvonne Orji, Jay Ellis, Natasha Rothwell, Amanda Seals, and Kendrick Sampson. The homie, what's up? The show follows the awkward experiences and racy tribulations of a modern day African-American woman. Uh, I was a fan of Insecure basically since it started, but I got I got stuck halfway through season three. And then I was like, cool, well, they're halfway through season four right now. So let me catch up. So I did. And I just still really love that show. And I think that show keeps getting better and better. I was actually very disappointed that it didn't win any Emmys because I thought this season was one of its best seasons um, especially for Yvonne Orji, who plays Molly, who had basically the entire fandom hating her for the entire season and having to remind themselves that she is not her character. Wow. But sh- wow. But the show is super funny. Um, there's a lot of great acting, a lot of great writing. Uh, it's super relatable. And I, season four, I really loved the exploration of friendship between uh, Issa and Molly because they kind of start growing apart and they start kind of... W- wanting different things with their lives but not really understanding each other and continuously just miscommunicating with one another which is why a lot of people weren't liking molly um so i really enjoyed like digging into that um and also digging into you know interracial relationships and stuff like that getting back with your exes at one point i can't remember if it was season three or season four because i watched them back to back but kendrick's character uh, i think he his character gets uh diagnosed with bipolar polar or he has anxiety it's one of the two and he and Issa's character are kind of dating and then he all of a sudden just ghosts her without a word um and then he comes back and and they kind of she finds out eventually what his struggle was and why he disappeared on her for that for that time so yeah it just goes into like a lot of different topics um and it's always really funny for me it's right up there with Atlanta I just think it's super funny but I also think it does the the drama really well um, and I think it does the relatable really well. So Insecure on HBO, I highly recommend it if you've never seen it. Round four, Dallas. Round four. All right. This show is proof that my love for superhero content outweighs my aversion to 1960s Texas. Is this the Umbrella Academy? This is the Umbrella Academy. Yeah. He's in two. Is this on my list at all? It doesn't matter. Oh, it is on my list, so I'll just knock it off. Yes, let's talk about Umbrella Academy. Let's do it. Okay, so the show is created by Steve Blackman, 
and developed by Jeremy Slater. I told you, I don't know the difference. Steve is a writer and producer for Bones, Fargo, Legion, etc. And Jeremy Bones. Slater, right? He's he's done something for everybody. But and Jeremy like... Slater, he wrote the scripts for the 2015 Fantastic Four and the live a- action Death Note movie, which, you know, those notes sound great. But apparently, Wait, the live action what movie? Death Note, that anime that they turned oh. into a live action movie. It was real bad. So yeah, I heard Colin! Heard. Hey, Colin. Hello. <laughs> I guess he is here. Yes, audience, if you picked Colin is here in the you were also game from right. before, you are also correct. You also win nothing. All right. So in the defense of Mr. Slater, apparently both of those films were changed dramatically after he gave them his script. I By the studios. Yes. I wasn't there. But also he is the lead writer for the upcoming Moon Knight show. Ooh. And we know he does TV shows well because of Umbrella Academy. Yeah. Also, it stars yeah. Ellen Page, Tom Hopper, David Castaneda, Emmy Raver Lantman, aka Boquisha from my fan cast of When Lamont Met Boquisha, <laughs> Robert Sheehan, and Aiden Gallagher as the Umbrella Academy. And oh, you missed um Justin. 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 The guy who plays Ben. ben. Oh, Ben. Dang it. Sorry. He was like, where? He's listed farther down because. Because he's not in as many episodes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Justin H. Min has been, ironically, he's like one of my favorite actors and characters on the show. Sorry, Justin, if you're listening. I doubt it. His superpower is so cool. The The hentai power? Yeah. Yeah, the hentai power. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What is he? So Gabby's into tentacles. hmm? Stop that right now. Oh, man. The furriness is coming out. (laughs) Stop it. Those are separate circles. Let's move on. I feel like if you're into animals. Like there is overlap. No, because it's. Because tentacles like are so abstract, dude, that people don't even. Wow, I should not have come into this anyway. <laughs> Let's move forward. Colin comes in and he brings in the the hentai conversation. There we go. Umbrella Academy, though, uh, season two, super good. I think it's better than the first season, mostly uh, because of the dynamic between the siblings. I agree. I do like season two a lot more than I like season one. I like the characters more. So, like, in addition to their dynamic growing and evolving, the characters do as well because. They pretty much just annoyed me across the board in season one. But I've grown to care for them and like them and not want them to die so much. So, yeah. See, I did not have that problem with season one. But I also rewatched season one right before season two came out, like a couple days before. Um, Yeah, it's just season two. It's just so nice to see the siblings get to interact with one another in a way that isn't completely always hostile um you get to see more of them together at a time versus in season one where it was usually just like two of them would be together and then another two of them would be together and then maybe another two would be together and then ellen page was completely left out (laughs) yeah uh i felt Uh, so bad for diego this season oh my gosh Uh, see so last season i had like no real feeling toward diego and this season he was one of my favorites and i think that also it helps that i also really liked the character of i can think of the actress's name right now i cannot think of her character's name rita uh no um lila lila ritu aria yes i yes i already kind of liked her from seeing her and other things that were far smaller um and i think she really got to shine as lila because i really enjoyed lila and the storyline that they give her i'm not going to say what it is because that would be a huge spoiler yes it would but she's amazing i love her on this show and i love the dynamic that she has with diego and i can't wait to see what they do with it in season three yes she was dope my favorite character from season one was mostly absent which disappointed me i really loved uh hazel Oh, Hazel. I love Hazel so much. And the part of that is because I love the actor Cameron Britton so much. But it's so I funny was... how little I cared about that storyline in season one. <laughs> like him and the old lady or him and Cha-Cha? Both. Or all of it. Yeah, I didn't... Man, like, the rewatching that I did do for season one cemented how much Cha-Cha got on my nerves. <laughs> but I think maybe I like Hazel so much because, like, as a contrast, like, she's so aggressive and hostile and violent. And he's, you know... Still a killer, but he's kind of like a teddy bear of a killer. I don't know. Also, he likes donuts, and I like donuts. Yeah. Donuts my char- my favorite character remains to be Allison Hargreaves, who was one of my favorite characters, I think, of all time last year. Whenever the first season was released, Allison was my favorite char- was one of my favorite top ten favorite characters of that year. Um, 
and I continue to love Allison. I like the storyline that they gave her in season two. Um, yes, with the civil rights I've movement. Very much like this storyline, and I'm very appreciative that they didn't give her an incest adjacent storyline this time around. Yeah, um, but also my boy Yusuf Gatewood playing her husband. I love Yusuf Gatewood, and I was so excited to see him on the show. Um, he was that dope. is my Mister Fantastic. If I could have my way, he's so good. Yes. Oh, also Aiden Aiden Gallagher. Yes, that's five. Number five. He's definitely going to be on my favorite actors of the year list because he was amazing. He's always amazing in that role, and Ellen Page does also does a great job as Vanya, which I liked Vanya a lot more this season. I liked Vanya. I always liked Vanya, except for at the end when she was, you know. You know, I liked Vanya most when she was trying to kill people at the end of last se- in the first season, because um, I was like, "Yo, the swagger is on point." But <laughs> otherwise, I was like, "Yo, Vanya, you're killing me right now." <laughs> so most of the time, I was like, "Vanya, you're killing me. You're killing me, Vanya." That um, but good. season season two, I really enjoyed. At season two, I feel like really, really pushed in on its um, that theme that they've got going, which is uh, abuse and the cycle of abuse and how that affects people and how you continue to go through that cycle of abuse, how you relate to other people through it. And I think they do a great job with that on the show. Yeah, they did that very well. They're good at that. The only, well, not the only, but like the main negative thing for me this season was that I really hate the trope of like romanticized infidelity. And oh yeah, I knew. See, and I knew when that storyline started, I was like, "Ooh, Dallas ain't going like this." <laughs> and you know, there are always different ways that shows and movies like justify it, quote unquote. But man, that one did not like it. Did not care for it. But other than that, the show's dope, and I highly recommend it if you're into superheroes and have a high tolerance for weird nonsense. Yeah. Also, episode one of season two has basically my dream X Men movie within the first five minutes. So. Nice. That was a really dope scene. Like, I wanted more of that. Which we kind of got at the end, the finale, too, actually. Yeah, they, like, gave us a nice beginning and end taste of it. Yeah. Also, their 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 final battle outfits are just super dope. I was like, I don't know if I, if I want to wear Allison's or if I want to wear Klaus's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Klaus. He's so much. Oh, Klaus is Ghost Boy? No, Klaus no, is. No, that's. Well, I mean, Klaus well, yeah. is Ghost Boy. <laughs> he's not the Ghost Boy, but he's the boy who talks to ghosts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was. Ben is other got, ghost. Got to be careful when you say Ghost Boy because it's like, well, oh there, yeah, there's like there's one that's an dead. actual ghost. Did you guys find out how he died? Yeah. Yeah, I think we've been known. I think he. Oh. Uh, well, no, actually, I don't think they've given us specifics. I think we know that he died in the field because their father quote unquote i don't like calling him their father he's not their father um <laughs> but he uh he blamed them all for his death at his funeral so oh, you yeah, know another act of abuse he's terrible that man is awful and i cannot wait to see what they do with season three because <laughs> man they messed up the timeline yeah it's gonna be fun moving on gabby yes what you got it's your turn okay so I started watching What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show, and it is exactly as ridiculous and silly as you would think it would be. <laughs> nice. um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement move mockumentary, What We Do in the Shadows. I'm um, familiar with it. I've never seen it. Oh, my God. To me, you got to watch it. It's so good. Um, so this TV show is basically takes place in that world but it's three no it's four vampire roommates living in new york and you actually find out about new types of vampires which is really cool and um oh god it's so funny there's two seasons it comes out on hulu and also um fx i believe and stars natasha demetrio matt barry Kevin novak harvey guillen and Mark uh, Prox, you know what? I don't know how to pronounce his name. This okay. is all good <laughs> names before we do. I podcast. know. Time out. I just want to say something for the people at home. Yeah. I think across the board now, if the show is on FX, then it's going to be on Hulu the next day because they have like a deal with them. Yeah, they do. Oh, they're it's all the, owned it's by the, the Disney same thing. Company. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, Hulu technically isn't owned by Disney. Disney just has the most stake in it. Oh, okay. Right, but yeah, you can watch it on Hulu. The day after it comes on FX. 
And that's your ad for the video. Yay. It's not even an ad. We didn't get paid they to do it. Sponsor us. Yeah, pay us. FX, give us some money, please. We're broke. <laughs> and we have like no qualms about advertising. <laughs> anyway, Gabby, the show. I mean, some qualms. Do we? Depends okay. on what we're advertising. <laughs> okay, boy. Um, anyway, so what's great about this show is it's like the same stuff from the movie it's just a brand new group of people um and it's it, and it's shot mockumentary style as well so you still have like on camera interviews and it's silly and ridiculous and there's werewolves just like in the other one and it's just oh it's just so funny um i uh they <laughs> they also do the thing where they go out and they find people to like kill and eat um, but they they were had like somebody special coming to visit them in like one of the first episodes, and so they went out and looked for virgins, <laughs> and they found them at like playing D and D. Wow! <laughs> Which I was like, low blow, guys. All but right, also, well, clearly they're not playing D and D with the right people, because, right? But it uh, was no. or LARPers. I don't know if it was LARPers. Hey, I think me. it was LARPers, hey, and me. then at night hey, they were playing D and D. Hey, hey to me, yeah, Colin. Hey to me. Are you telling me you fuck the people you play D&D with? <laughs> I'm telling you that I don't. All I'm saying is that there are loads and loads of people who play D&D. Not all of them are virgins, for sure. I know. I, I feel like that was a low blow and What is joke, stereotype, but I still though? thought it was hilarious. <laughs> what is stereotype? They were like, ah, yes, we know where to acquire virgins. And then the next scene is like, they're go- um, so they have like a familiar. And the next scene, they're like, um, Umbert, I think it's no Guillermo they're like Guillermo go find us virgins and he's like yes sir and then the next scene is him going into a park to talk to some LARPers <laughs> and yeah. I was like that's a low that's an easy <laughs> joke and then the next scene when then they're like where are we gonna look at these virgins it's like they're playing D&D or, or they're playing like a LARP slash kind of D&D combo where they're dressed up but they're also like rolling dice and it's hilarious <laughs> but wow. i'm still like this was a low blow guys this was really easy for you to this is a really mm, be- make better jokes <laughs> you're like this is low lowest common denominator come on yeah, guys I was like low hanging fruit very low um, hanging fruit but it's really funny and i do really recommend it <laughs> it's hilarious and uh there are s- there's still some appearances by like Taika YTT and Jermaine Clement and stuff. So, which I also like. And that's what we do in the shadows. It's your turn. Oh, snap. So the next show on my list is Love, Victor, which you can find on Hulu. The show stars Michael Cimino, Rachel Hilson, Anthony Turpel, B.B. Wood, Mason Gooding, George Sear with Isabella Ferreira, James Martinez, and Anna Ortiz. Uh, Victor is a new student at Creekwood High School on his own journey of self-discovery, facing challenges at home, adjusting to a new city, and struggling with his sexual orientation. It is the uh, spinoff of Love, Simon. I liked this show so much. Loved it, actually. Um, It's a great coming-of-age show. Uh, I love the cast and the characters. I was a fan of both of the people who were playing Victor's parents on the show before the show even started. I was like watching the show and I was like, oh my goodness, that's that's the dad. That's the douchebag dad from uh, One Day at a Time. Oh my gosh, the mom was on Whiskey Cavalier and played my favorite character on the show. I'm so excited about this. Oh my God, Whiskey Cavalier was so great. I Rest loved Whiskey peace. Cavalier and I was so sad that it was canceled yeah, before dude. it even finished season one. Uh, um, tragedy. So good. But now she's on Love, Love, Victor and she's really good on that show. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a really well written show. I I thought it was really fun, really cool look into just like, you know, being a teenager and struggling with your sexuality. Michael Cimino does a great job at playing Victor. I love Rachel Hilson's character on the show because, oh my goodness, she's so sweet and she doesn't deserve anything that's happening to her. It's not her fault. Anthony Turple is just playing the sweetest boy you can possibly ever see on a show i guess i don't know he's just so sweet on the show and so quirky it's great uh sophia bush and makai pfeiffer make appearances on the show as a couple which is so weird but like all right i'm with it cool is sophia bush good? i hope she shows up more on the show too with second season because the way that her character is going it seems like there's going to be some growth between her and um rachel hilson's character which is great Okay. Um, but I'm also just the show ended on a cliffhanger, so I'm really excited to see where season two goes. 
um, afterwards because they left it on a hardcore cliffhanger. That is Love, Victor on Hulu. Check it out. Last round, guys. Last round. Dallas. Last round. All right. This one is Entourage, but with football instead of movies. Ballers. Ballers. Yes, it is with football instead of movies. And it ages better because, you know, not everyone is a white dude. Yeah. It is created by Steven Levinson, who is a producer of Entourage, because of course he is. And it stars Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Rob Corddry, John David Washington. Yes, that one. Omar Miller and a bunch of other people. Didn't know that John David Washington was on that show. But I yeah. feel like I've heard that he was before and just don't remember that. Yeah, I'm getting the same vibes from I probably, as you to me. I probably mentioned it to you. It's really funny because the show has a lot of people who are like close to football. And John David Washington was a football player. Yeah, I also forget that he show, was a football player. Right. Everyone does. And he was in the show. I think I've seen him play football. In, you said you've seen him. Oh, right. We talked about that. Yeah, I think I saw him play college ball. Yeah, and then now he's like extremely famous. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, in this show, he's just like a super problematic, but working at it to get better football player. Nice. Yeah. The summary is a series centered around a group of football players and their families, friends, and handlers. But what it should say is Spencer, played by The Rock, spirals in different ways every season, and <laughs> you just watch it happen and hope for the best. My because big question is, there's five what's seasons your of the show, right? There's yes, there were five seasons. seasons. How did The Rock have time to make I always think that whenever I think else. about, every time I think about that show, I'm just like, how and when is The Rock filming the show? Like, on his break <laughs> hours or like? Yeah, because it's like, it was also like never delayed. Like, it was always on time, right? They yeah, it came put out, out every year. It came out yeah. 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. I didn't even realize that it had been on for five years, okay? If you had told me, I would have been like, yeah, it only has one season. And then The Rock went to do movies, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I thought it was like two seasons max because I kept hearing ballers, ballers, ballers. And I was like, oh, does that mean it's back finally for its third season? And it's like, no, Gabby, we've been putting out one season every year because The Rock apparently is a machine. Yes. And has and endless time, question mark? And he, like, he has a time turner. Is, he was yeah. doing at least two movies a year every year that the show was on yeah so is he just booked forever so is it just really close and everything has to be on time is it like okay i'm going to be on this movie set from this month to this month and then i'm going to this other movie set for this month to this month and then ballers you have me for three months like what when i i can't i couldn't tell you because it's not like the kind of show that oh you know we can just do it in the off time we'll just like use the set and blah blah, blah. like they go to different places and different stadiums that are like notably and like now they're in california and now they're in texas and now they're in vegas so like he's traveling for this show i yeah, don't know like how, how he does the things that he does maybe a time turner like demi said that must be also he's yeah. he's Dwayne johnson he's a superhero him and lin manuel miranda are the only people who i question on where do they find the time <laughs> right the rock is a superhero and he's like one of the most likable people in the world and in this show he is extremely irresponsible and like borderline volatile, but he's uh -oh. Dwayne Johnson. So I can't help but hope he wins because he's still Dwayne Johnson. And he just has that like charm to him. But I'm like, you are doing a bunch of dumb things thing. and you are self-destructive and you're, you know, bad for the people around you. But at your heart, you still want what's best for like these football players and everything. It's really a lot more like I just, you know, I thought it'd be entourage with football. Just rich people and money and titties but the show has a lot more going for it than that but also has rich people money and titties because it's hbo and i love the way that they tie current issues into the story because the show was going on for like the last five years so they talk about like the injustice protests and the ncaa exploiting college kids and they have episodes about like the colin kaepernick issue and all that stuff they talk about the fact that all of the owners are a bunch of old white men Making money off of these young black players who just got yeah. out of school. And I'm like, wow, talk to them. Which is crazy because the show is like using the NFL by name and using their teams and using their trademarks and all that stuff. And I guess the NFL is just like, whatever. You can say whatever you want. We're too big to fail. It's also probably one of those things where they're not watching the show. They're just like, oh, some random HBO show wants to, yeah, whatever. Who cares? We'll see. Last thing I wanted to say is that <laughs> this year 
Dwayne, like the year after the show ended, Dwayne Johnson and his ex-wife slash business partner bought a football league. Danny! So which like, one? Yeah, Danny Garcia. And they bought um the XFL, which is like, I don't have time to get into all of that. But <laughs> it's just like, if you watch the show, that is the most logical next step for The Rock's character. So just seeing him do that in real life is like, you were playing this character for so long that you were just like, yeah, the show's over, but let me just do the things he would do. Wow. Like in the last season, he becomes the owner of a team. And then in real life, the next year, he becomes the owner of an actual football league. And it's just the perfect way to cap that story off. Wow. But yeah, shout out to Dwayne Johnson and John David Washington and everybody else I said. And uh, Russell Brand, he's in the show a lot more than I expected. Oh, didn't even know he was on the show. I didn't either. He just popped up in like season, let's say three, and then was just there for the rest of the show. <laughs> I miss yeah. Russell Brand though. He was like I missed everywhere him too. for a minute, and then now he's like, where are you, Russell? Yes. And then also uh, Dulé Hill, a.k.a. Gus from Psych, is in the show. Oh, I just oh, think I of him, him as the guy from Holes. Yes. Oh, Sammy, I, I can man. fix that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> oh, but yeah, he's great. The show's great. I recommend it if you like football, entourage, and or titties. Moving on. Gabby, it's your turn. Yay. Okay, for my final show, I have been re-watching Bob's Burgers from the beginning because... Interesting. Um, it brings me a lot of comfort. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and I realized there's a lot that I've missed because I haven't ever watched it from the beginning. I kind of just like popped in and out of random episodes and then, you know, moved on. But there's a lot that I'm learning and it's pretty delightful. Also, there's an episode where Bob just tries crack and just mentions it really briefly. And I'm like, oh, my God, what? You say crack? (laughs) Yes, crack. (laughs) Yeah. He like, so what happens is Tina wants a birthday party and um, with like some very specific things. And Linda's like, well, let's do it. And then he's like, yeah, okay, we can do this, but we're not going to be able to afford rent. So I'll go ask for like an extension on the rent. And he goes to ask for the extension and his landlord's like, I'm not going to extend your rent, but I will offer you a job as a cab driver for a couple of weeks. And so he does that and he picks up um, some like trans prostitutes, question mark. And then he becomes their friend and like drives them around to all their different quote unquote dates for the night. And then he's like, at first it was like, he's like, I think I became a pimp. And then later he comes in and he's like, I think. You know, I just like he's acting kind of loopy and Linda's like, what are you doing? He's like, I may have tried a little bit of crack. Like, and it was like, what happened? (laughs) This is Bob. So that's um, that's one of the early episodes, actually, in like the first season. And I was like, wow, they just did this right off the bat. But it's really good. And um, I really love Bob's Burgers. And I didn't realize it had been on for 10 years, but it has. And it's great. 10 years. Yeah, it's been on since like 2010 or 2011. They're on like season 10 or 11 right now. That's crazy. Yeah. Also, for you guys and anyone listening, when you watch a show on Hulu, is Bob's Burgers always like the thing they recommend? Oh, yeah. They're aggressive with that. They love that show. Like it's. I don't think they ever do for me. But I also don't pay attention to whatever they're advertising. (laughs) Every time I finish a show, it's like Bob's Burgers, episode one, coming up next. (laughs) I'm like... I didn't ask for this. No, I always get shadow no. hunters. Interesting. Which means I that get... they know me. <laughs> they do. They do. Um, it depends. Um, for me, lately, it really wants me to watch the librarians. I don't know why. Ooh, but like Warehouse Thirteen. Cool. Kinda. I have no idea what the librarians is about. It keeps threatening to play it, or it'll just start playing the Mindy Project. <laughs> I don't know. I like that it's threatening to play. I was like, did you say threatening? It's gonna to play? happen. <laughs> well, because it's like it's coming up, it's coming up, and I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah, they give you the countdown too. It's like very ominous. <laughs> yeah, it's very like ominous. You got 15 and seconds, like, and you're watching no. Bob's Burgers. If you don't do something, yeah, about or it. like 50 seconds, or you're watching the librarians. <laughs> At least and Netflix like, is oh, like, God. here's a trailer. Yeah, Netflix is like, yeah, Netflix a trailer. Maybe like, you can check this you, out. Would you want to? And Hulu's and they're like, no, we're playing it. Like Hulu's like, nah, bro, I'm telling you what you're gonna watch. <laughs> yeah i mean it's not wrong question mark usually when it suggests something like it solidly playing the mindy project after something i'm done is like yeah like i do love me some mindy but it's fine it's whatever all right i guess that leaves it to me to give us our last show of the night day me, whatever time that you're watching 
Yeah. Hey guys, so the last show on my list is The ABC Murders, which you guys can find on Amazon Prime. It also aired on BBC. The ABC Murders stars John Malkovich, Eamon Farron, Rupert Grant, Freya Mavor, Shirley Henderson, and Anya Chilotra. The synopsis is, in 1933, retired detective Hercule Poirot is targeted by a taunting killer who sends letters signed ABC, which Poirot must decode in order to discover the identity of the murderer. And it is based on the novel by Agatha Christie. It's got a fantastic cast. Oh, my gosh. Like, Jesus. Like, I was like, oh, my goodness, Rupert Grant. I haven't seen you in, like, forever, dude. Where you been? I like him. Yeah, he exactly. has like a TV Giving show kids on ice cream and that's about oh, that it. Too. He's got a kid now, you know, he's just out here, he's just living his life. You know, Shirley Henderson, aka Moaning Myrtle. I'm, you know, what all this. I, I watched it mainly because Anya Chilotro was in it, and the only thing I'd seen her in it at this point was The Witcher. And I was like, I'd like to see you in something else. And she had a far bigger role in this than I was anticipating. It's really well shot, a very intriguing mystery. I literally thought that I had this whole mystery like figured out for like the entirety of the three episodes and i was completely wrong (laughs) but yeah it's like only three episodes so it's really fast to watch i think i watched it in one night i was like oh cool it's like a nice little mini series i'll watch like i'll I'll, you know watch some of it tonight and i'll watch the rest of it tomorrow and then it was like three like three hours and i was like oh i'm done wow Um, well all right then so yeah it was really fun seeing Eamon Farron and uh Anya Telotro work together before they did The Witcher they still don't have any scenes together on The Witcher but it's really cool just to see them on the same show and interacting together on that show like so hardcore and then not interacting at all on The Witcher because their characters just haven't crossed paths yet and I was obviously a fan of theirs from watching them on The Witcher before I watched this as well as Rupert Grant because you know grew up in the Harry Potter generation and um, I was a fan of Freya Mavor's before I watched this too because she was on Skins and I really liked her character in her gen so that was really dope and I just think that they do a really great job I I really loved watching the mystery I'm the type of person who if I'm watching a mystery show or a movie I want to be able to like like I want to figure out the clues I personally will not figure out the clues I know this about myself I'm not going to figure it out but when you when you tell me what the clue actually is, when you figure it out, I want to be able to go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Did you feel that way about this mystery? I did. Yeah. So I felt I felt good about this one. For instance, like I liked Kenneth Branagh's murder on the or- Orient Express. But like every time he would figure out a clue, I was sitting there like houseway. <laughs> <laughs> how did we get here? I don't even understand how you got to this conclusion. That one Houseway. Sure didn't make it Oh, man. But but I understood it with the ABC murders. And I might watch it again, actually, because it's so short and it's, you know, not too much of my time. And I really enjoyed it. But yeah, it's really good. Very intriguing. And uh, if you haven't, if you guys haven't checked it out, I would recommend it. You guys can find it on Amazon Prime. So that's it for the day, guys. Thank you guys for joining us on this quarantine watch. Next up will be our quarantine watch for movies. Yes. Thank you for listening to all those lovely TV shows that we just wanted to nerd out about with you yay yay <laughs> thank you crown digital brandon and i for putting us on spotify and apple Podcasts. thank you to me for editing and buying a new mic so soon so we could get this done yeah thank you colin for keeping our audience guessing in terms of whether or not you were here anytime thank you gabby for your apple tv password and You're for giving welcome, me a reason bro. to talk about dope i mean woke different thing yay. because i thought i'd have to wait weeks for that no, I sh- we should have known that we'd one of us would have watched it by now. <laughs> so good. I love we it t- so much. <laughs> anyway. I'm so glad you loved Mythic Quest as much as I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. I knew I was going to love that show from the trailer. Yay. But yes, Gabby and I are vibing. If you want to tell us about what you've been watching or, you know, talk to us about what we've, we've been watching or just say hi, you can find us on the medias on Twitter. We're at y'all underscore different on Instagram and Tumblr. We're at Creative Differences Podcast and on Facebook. Just search for Creative Differences and look for our picture. If you want to talk to me personally about superheroes, video games, football, whatever, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at a king named Simba. Hello, I'm Gabby, and you can find me on Instagram at Stegosoria. Hey, guys, if you guys want to talk to me about all things Star Wars, from <laughs> making it to uh, watching it, you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Dreamy Films. Dreamy is spelled D-R-E-E-M-I. Are we, Colin, are you introducing yourself? <laughs> Do I... Do I, I mean, I can, do He's I here. tell them where to find, like... He's here, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if you want to talk to me about why I wasn't in this episode, 
You can find me on Twitter at Duck McGuck. Yes, talk to Colin about hentai and D and D. Don't talk to me about hentai. D and D is fine. I don't watch. <laughs> I ain't watched hentai in years. I don't keep up with the current hentai. I don't know the scene. Like, don't Sorry. talk to me about hentai. Talk to Gabby about hentai. There we Ooh, go. No, I don't know. No, what they thank, you. no <laughs> thank you. No thank you. I've seen enough hentai to see where this is going. No thank you. Oh, wow. it's I'm been <laughs> man. It's been different. It's been, it's been different. different. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh God. <laughs>